Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. As you've said, I've traveled a great deal to the Congo. And some ten years ago, I had the privilege of meeting uh, Dr. Dennis Mukavwe, who became the head physician at the Pansy Hospital. And over the years, I saw his hospital grow bigger. And uh, in the beginning, he was a gynecologist who dealt with the normal problems, uh, uh, premature pregnancies for young women. But over time, he started treating victims of sexual violence. Uh, and uh, now he has, over time, treated more than 30,000 women, women who were lucky enough to be able to go to the hospital because most of them have been victims of uh, sexual violence and they live in uh, remote areas and they, they cannot travel and they've been unable to get to Pansy or the hospital in Mukabe or in Goma, where there is another specialized hospital. So the women that one meets in these hospitals have a classical gynecological problems, but they are also suffering from the aftermath of v rape and a terrible infection known as fistula, which destroys the genital uh, uh, body and turns women into pariahs. They are repudiated by their husbands, they are driven away, they become beggars, they lose everything. And it is thanks to Dr. Mukabwe that I learned about these women and I try to understand the history of their sufferings. And I'd like to to remind you that, and something that is very important, that this is not part of the culture of the people who live in the Great Lake regions. That's not, it is often said that it is part of their history, but it's not true. It, traditional warriors, the, the Mai Mai combatants, uh, were forbidden to have any contact, any se sexual contact w with women before going out to combat. So this is not part of their tradition. It is, alas, a modern-day uh, practice. But it's spread like an epidemic. Their situation, the situation of women in the country has always been a hard one. They marry too young, they have hard physical labor, they have too many children, they've been ill-treated at times. But practice, the practice of rape as a practice of war was introduced in Ru Rwanda 1994 for the first time. This took place during the massacre of the Tutsis by the Hutu and it, when an ideology of hate grew. And it was only during the tri tribunals of Arusha or elsewhere dared to speak about what happened to them, about the rapes that they were submitted to where they uh, caught HIV, AIDS, and other venereal diseases. And we began to understand that WAPE was not just uh, the result of, of pleasure-seeking, but it was a weapon of war against women to weaken their ability to survive and to uh, destroy an ethnic group. Now this ha spread throughout the region and had a great effect. It w went into neighboring Congo and after all these months of genocide, there were two million refugees, including militia and civilians. They were brought to Congo to the Kivu forest. They were lodged in refugee camps. And in 1996-97, Rwanda uh, carried out an offensive uh, against these camps, obliging most of them to return to their countries. But the most radical amongst them, the ones who, who had the most hate, stayed in Congo. And they lived in the forest, 
in particular in this area where the land was so fertile, an area where there were mines and they became entrenched there as they started to carry out trade there and they started to impose the local population uh, to their violence. So this came from outside but it spread through society like an epidemic. And it was then that Dr. Mukwebe, a gynecologist, saw that practices were changing, that the women who were coming to consult him did not only have gynecological problems or the victims of rape, they were being tortured. Now, when I went to Kivu and I went to Panzi Hospital and elsewhere, I discovered the horror of what these women had suffered. It was no longer a question of men seeking sexual pleasure and, and people who misbehave because they have a gun. No, there we saw women who were mutilated in series. We saw guns shot into their vagina. We saw the destruction of their vaginas. We saw uh, plastic being poured into vaginas. We saw infections that could not be cured. We saw these women who were being destroyed physically and morally. As of 2000, we realized that the kind of violence had changed. People were no longer just being brutal, but they were engaged in a strategy of destruction. These acts of terror, these abominable acts, were taking place in the presence of the children, of the husband, of the villagers. It was being done before them to attack, to attack their dignity, the husband's dignity, and in that way they tried to destroy the dignity of the community. And they stood by powerless, and their dignity was destroyed watching their wives being uh, uh, raped. Uh, these women then leave, they leave their fields, they wander around aimlessly, and armed groups come in, uh, become established, they turn the people into slaves, make them work for them in the quarries, or grow crops for them. They break down the resistance of the population. They kill the traditional leaders as well, and they dominate the population. And over time, we learned about the, how this rape was spreading throughout the region. It, wasn't, it was no longer just the militia who had carried out the genocide in Rwanda who were practicing this in the region. They were not the only ones. The Rwanda army and other armed groups occupying, occupying Kivu also started to massacre civilians and some rapes as well. But the practice of rape spread, and this was encouraged by impunity. There had been 30 years of dictatorship in Congo, 10 years of war, and this war had destroyed the legal system, the judiciary. And the rapists were sure that they would never be punished. And as time went by, more and more armed groups sprang up. Some were from Rwanda, some were from Congo. But might made right. And they all adopted the same practices as to terrorized the civilians. They recruited boys and turned them into child soldiers. They took young girls away and turned them into sexual slaves. And they mutilated people in order to instill a reign of terror. And this epidemic of, of rape was adopted by the Congolese military as well because they were sure they would go unpunished. And these uh, women were repudiated by their husbands and there were tragedies. I saw a case where a young woman had been uh, raped and, uh, and the solution was to ask the rapist to give uh, two uh, goats to the parents. And the parents got something, uh, the woman got nothing.
and uh, they felt this was sufficient. Often the women are driven from their villages, they're repudiated, and they end up in cities, uh, and uh, they have to turn to prostitution to earn a living. But despite the peace agreements and despite the fact that there have been elections twice in Congo, the problem has, is far from being resolved. In 2012, there was a new rebellion that broke out, uh, and uh, new people took uh, control of the territory. And for women, this new war has made the situation even worse. Uh, there are more than 600,000 displaced people now, and they live under tarps, under plastic uh, sheds, uh, in makeshift shelters. The women are extremely vulnerable. And the men have been recruited as members of the military, or they've left. And the women have to go out to look for wood, for fires. And as soon as they do that, they become prey of these armed groups. They're attacked. There are many cases of sexual violence. Uh, uh, child recruitment has begun again. The schools have been taken over by the soldiers or by the displaced people. They burn the chairs and the tables, and boys are recruited as soldiers, and uh, the girls are raped. There is great violence also against civilians. There are taxes they have to pay at customs uh, points. Uh, there are there's violence committed against people who are hostile to the military. Now, the government tells the military not to do this, but uh, ill treatment is being carried out against the civilians anyway. And, and this uh, war has led to a number of armed groups springing up, and people who, with weapons turn into a military group that uh, destroy the culture of their villagers and, and threaten the lives of the villagers. And they turn people into slaves. They have the people work for them in the mines, uh, some gold mines and tin mines. And this money goes to supporting the war. So what is the role that the international community can play? We have to recognize that we are all aware of this situation. There have many investigations. And since 2002, a UN force has been deployed there. And this is the biggest UN intervention in the world. There are 17,500 men who have been deployed. And this costs 1 billion, 200 million per year. This is a great deal of money for peacekeeping efforts in Congo. Now, there are political problems, there are governance problems, yeah, but there may not be violence everywhere. But in, in Kivu, the violence continues. And the UN force is too timid. The mandate is too limited. Sometimes the UN forces accompany women to the markets, but the tanks and the and they have tanks in the villages, but they cannot intervene in the countryside. And so when massacres take place, and there I was a witness to this, the armed men attack the village, they rape the women, and they take away their children. They tell the peacekeepers of the UN, but they arrive the next day when everything is over. They take photos, they write a report. The report goes to New York. They can't do anything, and they don't fight themselves to track down the aggressors and to bring them to justice. So the women are not being protected. And this is uh, what leads a man like Dr. Wukwege to despair. He has been a witness before the UN. He has testified. Now, even stars have come to the area. The international community has, has come, but the international community is not doing anything. And in October, in the, the UN and governments and the government of Rwanda was attacked in Belgium. And when he went back to 
Bugavu, he was almost assassinated in his own home because Dr. Mukawe has the courage to denounce international complicity. And to say that this mining was bringing in money to foreigners, but nobody was doing anything to protect the women of Kivu. And that he, as a doctor, felt powerless. That he felt great despair. He treated women with fistula. It was a very delicate operation to repair the vagina. And then he felt guilty about letting the women leave the hospital, cured, and see the same women raped once again, raped, and the, with a need for another operation. But this was important because you can't do it uh, many times. So are there any solutions? Well, I think that we have to take the problem for, at the root at its origin, support the state, support local authorities, strengthen military jurisdictions so that all these armed men who have committed atrocities be brought to book and create more tribunals so that people will know that if women are, if, you, if the men rape, then they will be brought before the law. Now, there is a great deal of information that has been gathered. Can can show that this, all this violence has not been spontaneous. It wasn't improvised. There was a political and economic goal to it. And these people, the leaders of this movement, can be traced. There is a temptation to take over through rape, take over political poli policy. We have to make sure that the mining industry is regulated, that women slaves will be freed, and that the money that is that comes through this mining is. Uh, is stopped, and now I'm speaking personally. I think that everything is interlinked. I think we need hum that, that the humanitarian and compassionate solutions are just not enough. Demonstrations are just not enough. Just saying that Bukov is a capital of rape is not helpful. It's just shameful for the populations because these people are the victims of uh, this armed violence. It's not part of their tradition. We must not subvert the Congolese state. We have to strengthen it, support it, uh, help the local authorities carry out their duty to protect their population. We have to support the judiciary and the security system and monitor effectively the border between Congo and its neighbors so we can track uh, the infiltrations of armed men on one side and on all sides. In 2009, Rwanda and Congo had entered into an agreement concerning security. And uh, later this was broken, war broke out again. But it's the people of the region themselves who must build peace. It's not the West that should, the, the West should help but we must support the local authorities. We must systematically support the women of the region through education, social efforts, and uh, income generation. And I'd like to conclude by saying the women of Kivu are not only victims, it's not only the capital of rape, uh, they are also very courageous women. They are economic actors, they produce wealth, they support their families, they support society, and they must be helped. And we see often that mutilated women who have been raped, whom we think have been destroyed, they're resilient, they start again, they are launched in life again, they take up economic activity again or farming, they refound families. 
And then we have the problem of children and the children who are born out of rape. Women will often find a spouse, a um, man who will marry them, but these men say, I don't want the children. I don't want the children born of rape. And so these children sometimes are abandoned. So this is a time, time bomb in the region. There are thousands of such children born of rape who have been abandoned. And they who live in great distress. We must have international aid. This is not very popular. There aren't many NGOs uh, who are focusing on this issue. The women's role in Kivu must be recognized in their identity of uh, citizens and producers of well, and we must uh, help them achieve their dignity again. Thank you.